Good morning. This is field 307. That is nationalism, our level 300 elective for the 2023-2024 academic year. I'm addressing the city campus class. And this will be our second lecture that we are doing online. The first one was in person introductory. And so we'll do our online today. And we are discussing, as you can see on the screen, the team on the rationalist thesis. The thesis is plural. So the various ways of thinking of rationalism, the, the, the various tenets, you know, uh, propositions, the statements that rationalism makes. And I always like to, we also have played the recordings on the academic channel, my academic channel that I keep referencing. You will see that some of the examples I'll be using, you'll hear them there. That think of rationalism and empiricism as in Ghana, two traditional, you know, religious groups. You can think Islam and think Christianity, for example. Okay. So there is this broad supposed distinction between, I say supposed because some don't think there is any substantive difference between the two. It's just uh, doctrinal or what I believe. That is some view. In the same way, some think rationalism and empirism are really not opposed. It's just something. And so as you advance, you can see all those argumentations. But then to a certain degree too, we can tell that Islam or Islamic religion, at least as practiced in Ghana, is not the same as Christian religion. There are certain basic foundational assumptions that do not make them coincide okay so the christian and then the muslim if you think of it that way the rationalist versus empiricist what distinguishes those two extremes will be looked at but the core discussion of today's topic this one is what are the various ways the various theses and uh, the various tenets that ground what we call rationalism so that think of the christian religion for example if you see someone in the a, a lady in the hijab you might think that that is a good sign for example that that person is uh, uh, belongs to the islamic religion or practices the islamic religion but you will be amazed that there are some christian congregations that put on a covering like that. You also wear a hijab of a kind. The, the, the covering. I think the hijab is a covering that the ladies put on. And so you may not be able to just use that to distinguish, for example, a Christian, supposed Christian uh, religion as practiced in Ghana from Islam. In the same way, there are certain things that when you started learning rationalism from levels 100 and 200, epistemology uh, and the two branches of this epistemology would think that there are two main ways of distinguishing a rationalist view from an empiricist view. But as we advance and we are engaging rationalism alone as a thesis, as we get closer, it is like we are looking into the details of that uh, epistemological position. You may have a revision of thought about what you should consider as a rationalist view and what you should say is not rationalist. So the whole point is you may now be able to see into certain assumptions that you would have called rationalists. That for now you won't call rationalist, or you won't say it is not necessarily the case. Okay? Be because then it looks like it could cut across someone entering a congregation and then removes the slippers or the separation between a sitting arrangement of males and females would have been a, 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 an, Islam, a, an Islamic thing. But you could see that also in certain congregations that call themselves Christian. What is the whole point? Some traditionalists called, we know traditionalists sacrifice, let's say, animals or they use animals for pacification and what have you. Some congregations that will call themselves Christian also do that. And so what then, this is the question, what then makes someone Christian? Now we use that just a symbolism to get it. So I bring it back to the debate. What then makes a view a rationalist one? That's what the theme is about. 
Okay, so this one is saying, we want to throw some light on the rationalist thesis, the various ways, the things that make someone rationalist. We want to throw light on it to bring understanding. Now, when you look on my screen, my screen now, I am interested in helping the class engage. So it's not something I'm coming to pour on you, pour, 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 then you receive and go out for. No. It is an engagement. You you interact with it. You it's an intercourse of a kind. You you it's when I give you the information as we have we have seen it in the text, we are supposed to chew on it and reflect on it and interrogate. That is the methodology for doing philosophy, especially at this level and for a course like rationalism. Okay, so you are going to engage the key things of rationalism. Not that you are going to receive, you are going to hear from me. That, no, you're going to engage it so that you critique. Some of them you will query. Some of them you will raise, raise your objections. Ah, but this one, how different is it from the exact? That is what we are going to, that's my task. I want to engage you with the key themes of rationalism. Rationalism, not in the generic sense of it. So you write down that point and read and clarify. Oh, you say be rational about the way you are behaving. Be rational. I'm not talking that use of the word rational. It's not the epistemological position of rationalism in philosophy. It's just the general way of using the term to mean apply some kind of uh, critical ability to it. If you add anything, you think about it well. So don't give that little girl a big bucket of water to carry. I mean, be rational. How can you ask her to carry that big bucket of water from here to Akusombo uh, and back? Be rational, please. That say, sense of saying be rational doesn't mean be opposed to the empiricist. No. It is just saying that uh, be realistic. Okay, so the term rational can have the general use of it. Be realistic, be reasonable, eh? be, 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 be uh, accommodating. So that is generic. When we use rationalism or rational in this context where we are studying it as a course, we are thinking of it in the technical sense. So inflation, when I say I'm going to inflate the balloons for the Christmas decoration, I'm using the word inflation. But I don't mean it the way the economist means it when he says the, uh, the economic uh, whatever whatever indices are inflated or we are suffering from the effect of inflation. We are not saying we are suffering from the effect of blowing balloons. Okay, as a whole point, if the uh, philosopher talks of an argument, it's not necessarily exchange of words. There can be a meaning of argument that's you oop argument um, you like arguing um, okay that's there. But when the, the thinker, the philosopher, the logician says this is an argument, he's referencing premises leading to a conclusion, like we saw in elements of formal logic, like we saw in critical thinking, like we are seeing now in deductive logic. Okay, so these are technical versus generic use of terms. That's the whole thing I'm trying to show you, just to set us out nicely that here, when we talk of rationalism, we are thinking of the word rational in the technical sense of it, in the uh, academic sense of it, in philosophy. So that rationalism we are going to study is the epistemological position from the word epistemology, the study of knowledge, okay? That says something, it says that reason, blah, blah, blah. We're going to look at that. Reason is the source of knowledge, blah, blah, the test, the justification, the warranty, the grounds, our uh, claims of knowledge, as opposed to the senses opposite to thinking that it is rather the sense of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, that gives us, uh, you know, the sources of our knowledge. That would have been empiricism or empiricism. So we are going to study rationalism as an epistemological position, not rationalism as a generic sense of the word rational or reasonability or whatever. That one, even the empiricist is rational because the empiricists will argue from reasonable point, will use critical ability, will reflect and so on and so forth. So it doesn't make him any less an empiricist. If you are referencing rationalism in the general sense, oh, be rational, be reasonable. 
that one, even the empiricist, will be rational. Okay, dear friends. So we will look then at rationalism in the technical sense of it and then open it out a bit more. So what clearly distinguishes a rationalist from an empiricist, that means we are talking technicality. What are the various ways of being rationalist? I pause for any question if there is. Please raise your hand if there is any question. So you are sure you got the understanding from the lecture hall, you will mop up with your reading material and then start constructing and thinking around these ideas for practical use and for solving societal problems as a rationalist. I went to print my exam questions the last time, I think last year or the year before, and the folks read the questions that had been set and they said, why is it that everybody in the university is not doing a course like this? <laughs> and I smiled and sat down, and waited for my turn to print because they were not philosophers in that room there, but it was almost like a consensus because these are the things we need as students to be able to do. Not that you poor person forget. I, I took the compliment, but I remained modest. You should see the essence of that. These are from colleague faculty who thought that this must be, just like we are doing critical thinking and philosophy course that is now university-wide, because we need that. We need people to rationalize, to be rational. You see that I use another notion of rational, rationalism, to rationalize. You, you are trying to make a justification for the thing. Sometimes you rationalize things that are not even defensible. That's another connotation of the word. And then to be rational about matters. The people are hungry, the people are overstressed, the people need a little breathing space. Be rational about it. That is another use of the word, okay? Then you say, I told you to take a lot of uh, green, 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 bejrune, kontumre and thing, green, green leafy vegetables so that you will not suffer uh, anemia during your labor. You didn't take it. Now you are going to push baby out. Look at how you are struggling. You don't have blood. Hey, bring me contumery. Bring me uh... a... <laughs> I am not going to match contumery in the hospital when the woman is in labor. To give her the blood. It will give blood. Good, natural, you know, no problem blood. But is that the rational thing to do? Dear friends, at an emergency, is a lie. <laughs> so, the, 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 the notion of rationalism, rationality, being rational, et cetera, et cetera, is something that we cannot overlook. And so we are more concerned even about the technicality and how the rational uh, differs from the empirical and how the rational may be rendered in various ways. So we have the Pentecostal version of Christianity, for example, the charismatic, they say, the orthodox. And in the orthodox, there are versions, the Catholicism, the Protestant, and what have you. You can see, uh, uh, when you come to Islam, yesterday I got tutelage in class. Someone taught me that the, the uh, Ahmadiyya, and then the Sunnah or something, I hope I got it right. That should tell you, you could see a, somewhere, a lady that is, doesn't have the hijab, that I was told, and yet it's a version of some uh, Islam. The whole point then is what are the various ways of being Christian, for example? What are the various ways of being? They are all Christian, even in their variety. There are certain things that are essential to that view. That means, what should I see in a belief, in a doctrine, in a philosophical position, in epistemology, to call it rationalism? That is the concern. Okay, I, I want one of you to read this very quickly, just to sustain your attention quickly. So raise your hands if you want to read something very quickly. Very, I think you've done well. We have a good number now. I saw your class rep rallying, <laughs> rallying your attention, which is good. It's fucking you up. Look, everybody start joining now before the woman's back. <laughs> but I think it's good. You have good organizational skills, Freeman, and your team there. Yeah. Keep it up. Gabriel, read for me, please, what you see on your screen. What is rationalism? Mm -hmm. In philosophy, rationalism is the epistemological view that regards reason as the chief source and test of knowledge. Well done. Well done. So if nobody knew anything, suppose you never entered philosophy class, you don't even know what philosophy is. With this slide, you should be set off 
it should give you some confidence that, oh, okay, when you hear the word rationalism in the technical sense that we said you are going to focus on, you should be thinking about an epistemological view. And epistemology may worry you, but I think for our class, we have gone through that. Epistemology just means a study of knowledge, episteme knowledge, logic study. So studying knowledge, how we come to know, how we justify our claims of knowledge, can we be certain about what we claim to know, those kinds of philosophical questions fall within the area in philosophy called epistemology, okay? So we, our friend Gabriel says, in philosophy, when we say rationalism, it is an epistemological view. It is one of the views in our study of knowledge. Which view is that the one that regards reason as the chief source and test of knowledge. Okay, that should give you a feel. Okay, so it means that if I wanted to test my claim of knowledge and I appealed to reason, the mental, not what my eyes are seeing or my ears are hearing or my, my hands are touching or my tongue is tasting, but I appeal to something beyond the senses. I reflect about it. I connect two things together. I'm seeing him holding the gun, but I say, what if someone else did it, but put the gun in his hand and his thumbprints are there? I'm applying something beyond what I see or hear or touch or taste or smell. Okay. So if I use that as my test, not the only test, but also as the source. Where did the knowledge come from? From reason. How do I test the efficacy of that knowledge using reason? Then I may be properly be labeled as what a rationalist. And so it is one way of thinking of rationalism is to think of it as the, the view in philosophy, epistemological view that considers reason as the chief source, chief. And that should tell you that if something is the chief, such a rendition of epistemology, uh, of rationalism, sorry, could make accommodation for empirical source as well. Just that it will make reason the chief. So someone can think of rationalism this way, and it doesn't mean the person has said therefore that the empirical doesn't give us any knowledge of, we can source knowledge from the empirical. He's just saying that reason is the chief, okay? I want you to understand the overlaps. That is why I've spent a lot of time showing you how some Christian congregations wear myrafi, you know, some do even animal sacrifice, some don't. All the things that you would have thought is another religion, another group's way of doing things, you can find them in another. So it means it is possible for you to find certain things that you would have called rationalist in what you would have called empiricist. When you look closely, even though we do a general de demarcation between the two, what we are doing now is a closer look of the concept. The whole course is rationalism. So you may see some details now that you would normally overlook in levels 120. And that's what I'm helping you see. One way of thinking of rationalism, Gabriel read it, is that it is the chief source. When you take reason as the chief source, chief, chief, master, doesn't mean there can be a subordinate. There could have been a subordinate source, a test of knowledge, if you held on to that view. And yet you also be called rationalist, okay? The second one, I think the hands are many, so let someone also read to help us connect when we are trying to remember. Thank you, Gabriel. So I'll take Sarah Santua. Sarah, please read the second one. Doc, that is any view that appeals to reason as a source of knowledge or um, justification. Very good. Any view that appeals to reason as a source of knowing or justifying. You see that this one they didn't put chief source, but it said as a source. A source means it is one of them. Look closely at the claim, you will see. It doesn't mean it is the source. So someone, look at it, some churches allow people, I use the church, please bear me out. I want you to connect, I want you to understand. Okay, so I'm using things that you can relate to too. So when you get the understanding there, then I transfer it to what we are doing. Some churches allow their congregation, their congregants to drink. It's, it's okay. 
You don't see anything wrong with it. So if you are not careful and you belong to a church that thinks that drinking is totally prohibited, you might think of them as non-Christian. But you don't see anything when they will reference Paul telling Timothy that because of your stomach pain, takes more. You know, some don't eat pork. Don't, so you would think that because they are not eating pork, they are like it's a, a Muslim. No, they don't. But they are still Christian. You see the overlap. Some too, oh, uh, what are the other things that I can do? They do a uh, saraka. Yes, they do it. And saraka is supposed to be seen as the opposite religion. But they do that. They do it every Friday. They will do saraka. And it is a Christian church. They remove their uh, under the slippers and sandals and whatever at the entrance of the the temple or con congregation and enter and they call themselves Christian as well. The whole thing I'm trying to show you that so this man, the second point here that sister read for us, Sarah read for us, says this that you can also think of rationalism this way. Be careful not to demand of every rationalist that you read to be saying something that you think should be rationalist. This one said that is any view that appeals, it appeals to reason as a source. A source. A source. That is still a version of rationalism. The other one, so you can have the liberal church, the auto, uh, you know, even your French, um, some you can't even turn your lip. If you put lipstick right, you're in trouble. Do roll on. Don't put uh, dye in your hair. You know, don't wear earring. Various versions. Yet they are all. Don't wait, watch them, the devil's box. That's television. They're all Christian. Telling you that, uh -huh, be careful not to impose. So the rationalist view can be this. This is a source of knowledge or justification. The earlier one, Gabriel Red says, as the chief source and tests, but they are all, you will see something that is common. They're all appealing to reason. They're all appealing to reason. They're all appealing. But what they do with reason is the difference. Thank you, Sarah. I'll take someone else now to read. Remember the people who read. It will help you get the connections. So let's let's get to read now. Then Forsen will be next. Forsen now will get to read. A methodology or theory mm. in which the criterion of the truth is not mm. necessary. Sensory, no, no, that but way. intellectual and inactive. You can't hear. Don't worry, the person is chatting with Johnny Bravo. Okay, <laughs> so get to, <laughs> I've just muted that person. Get to just read and said, we can also reflectively think of the, the discipline called rationalism or the school of thoughts called rationalism or the epistemological view called rationalism. This way, which way is that? When we think of it as a method, how something is that? It's a methodology yeah. or a yes. Is someone calling me? Andre, are you calling me? Or are you are calling Johnny? Johnny Bravo and I'm Okay, let's continue. It's a methodology or theory in which the criterion of the truth is not sensual. So this one's focus is on method, methodology. The, the person is defining rationalism in terms of how you establish truth. It is not talking of rationalism in terms of the source of that truth, but how you go to the source. <laughs> okay, when you use the intellect and you do deductions, like you are doing deductive logic, the person is thinking of rationalism as that, because these ones, the way you conceptualize rationalism, can determine whether you say you assume innate ideas or you just think that, oh, it's just intuition and deduction. We are getting the shot, the work I've given you, which your friends or men can put the good job, at least the ones that presented, one group presented. Mm -hmm. Are you talking the method of arriving at truth? The method of arri arriving at a truth is not the same as the source of that truth. Something has happened. But this one, this understanding of rationalism is talking of how you arrive at that truth. The earlier ones and some others that we will keep looking at, various versions of it, they are looking at where the truth is sourced from, the source. 
some are using as how, some are looking at how we justify what we say we know, justification. Some are looking at how we test the efficacy of what we knew. See that? So the emphasis are not the same for all. And that's why I've, I said I use the church thing. You can drink, don't get drunk. You can marry three wives. You probably can take care of them. That sounds like Muslim, if I get it right. You see that? But I don't say one man, one wife. In the beginning, it was not so. You can't even divorce. Even if they are killing you, stay there. And they are all, uh -huh. they are all Christianity. Or they are all, the same goes for another religion. So I just want the one that I know very well I can speak to. Okay. So this one, the emphasis is on criterion or method of arriving at truth. It's not so much on justification or source. All right. And then he says that but there is something that will make you and I and everybody watching still call the various versions rationalism. Go here to talks about intellect and deduction. That is the two. Earlier one, so this one is uh, Gertrude's own number three. This one was Sarah Asantua, my way of helping myself remember when I'm thinking. You can learn to do that. Asantua told us that when you appeal to reason as a source of knowledge or as a source of justification of your claim, so you see that the emphasis is on source. And then Gabriel said, no, no, not just source, but the test of it. And here, he doesn't mean reason as the only source. That hasn't been said. He says reason as the chief. Chief. You see that? Then as Asantua's own, own said, reason is a source. This means it, even that source may be the small boy there. Yes, the empirical may be bigger than the the uh, yet it says it is a source and then the last one they didn't talk about source they talked about criterion and intellect and deduction someone called me please what is the question was it asantua janet and now before for is asantua's microphone that is not muted please ask your question and let's really? continue was it a question please ask Okay, we continue. Maybe it wasn't here. So we'll continue. Now, I think uh, Naomi is ready to read for us. So Naomi will do as the Anna, Naomi Forsen. Please read the next thing on your screen now. I'm happy to tell you to make a note. So go ahead. Note. Different degrees of emphasis lead to a range of rationalist standpoints. From Good. the moderate position that reason has pre precedence over other ways of acquiring knowledge mm -hmm. to the extreme position that reason is the unique part to knowledge well done let me explain that naomi uh, this voice sounds like it has read for me before do you read in classes that i conduct or this yes. is your first time yes no okay um naomi so let, let let me explain now for everyone to hear this is what Naomi said. Naomi said, from what we have done so far, what I presented on screen so far, you will see that depending on the degree of emphasis, how I'm emphasizing something, you see how we call certain churches liberal, they allow things, and others we think they are strict fundamentalists, even Islam. We will see that some are liberal Islam practitioners, and others are very, a conservative and strict and what is it fundamentalist you can't even bring pork meat around the area there you have trouble others they won't eat it but they are not too overly you know stringent so we are able to say some are moderate hello some are moderate don't get distracted though. moderation moderate and others are extreme extremists now when we come to our talk about Rationalism and praises, watch on your screen. Depending on the degree of emphasis, we are able to tell whether this is an extremist, staunch rationalist position, or the one that we can say is rationalist, but the type that is liberal. It means it's accommodating of so much that you would have taught is empirical. Okay. One of them is when one gives reason precedence over the others. 
precedence means it presides over the other. It, it also same back on. It's more than the other. Okay, so you you give it attention. Look, among the guys, a lady can tell you, you I, I I have you have given him precedence over the others. It means there could be other. <laughs> There could be others in the in the in the story, but you are giving him let's say sixty percent. So as the others, maybe the other four that you are still juggling amongst them, which one would you pick ultimately? This one gives sixty percent. Precedent doesn't mean you are the only. So you see that it is moderate. When you say reason has precedence over other sources of knowledge, remember the one whose own said that chief source. That was Gabriel's own. It's, it is the chief source. Master source. I said that cannot be interpreted to mean that there can't be other sources. So it can accommodate empirical as also a source. That's why it is a moderate view. If I asked you to interrogate Plato's claim that so and so and so in the context of moderacy or extremity, giving practical illustrations to show that ubi to me, I announced to me, that's what we are learning. Okay. Then there are other views that on your screen now, we will label as extreme because it doesn't say reason has precedence over another. No, it says reason is the unique or the move for. <laughs> there is none anywhere unique path to knowledge. So we would consider that as extreme. Thank you, Naomi. I still have some more hands, and I'm very, very impressed with the class. This is online. First class, we have already registered 93 students city campus. It is it is breaking news. I'm going to give it in the news. The class size on Sakai is I think 103. So if I know there might be others who are still working school fees out and whatever. And some may even be cool, you know, joining. And the class is well comported and it is very impressive. Well done. Let me take um King Silikumi now. Whilst Princess and no stands by. Please go ahead. Sir. Yes, mom. The rationalist thesis in detail. At its at its core, rationalism consists of three basic claims. For one to consider oneself a rationalist, he or she must adopt at least one of these three claims. One, the intuition or deduction thesis, the innate knowledge thesis or the innate concept thesis, may also adopt either the indispensability of reason thesis or the superiority of reason. Well done. Well done. That was Kinsley. Now, what Kinsley has read is key. It now summarizes all that has been said so far and then hits on the point itself. Depending on whether you are moderate or extreme, you will, as I say, depending on whether you are moderate or extreme, uh, rationalist will depend on here what is happening here and how it is happening. Okay, so let's put flesh to it. Kinsley says, for you to be called a rationalist, so now quickly. So that it doesn't become too technical. Let your mind go for you to be called a Christian, for example, or for you to be called Muslim. What must you believe? If you are Muslim, Jesus Christ cannot be called the Son of God. That's blasphemy. God is one. Allah Akbar. See that? One. He cannot have a wife to have a son. That's at least for that one. If you have the label Islam attached to you, you would have to believe that. You cannot say, uh, there are three gods or four gods or Allah Wakbar, one God. Okay. That's that alone. Whether you wear hijab or you eat pork or you don't do this or you do that, the versions won't take from the fact that you hold on to this one. That is a determinant of what makes you Muslim of any type. When you come to Christianity, you cannot say, look at the name, it's Chris. Sin. You cannot deny Christ and call yourself Christian. You would have to admit that there is Christ. Perhaps what you think he is, some say she, 
Thank you, Sherry. Today, do you have it? Some say she. What you think he is will vary. Some may think he's God made man. Some say how that doesn't make sense. He's the son of God. The Holy Spirit is a mother. Some depending on what you are reading, they are all Christian. From um, my friend said, Book of Mormon, Adam Smith to others, various versions. But there is one thing that is central: Christ. That's why they are Christian. My point is, now that you get that, just to relate, you grab that, then I bring the symbolism into what we are doing. For you to be called rationalist, you must subscribe to must. It is a must. I told you Allah Wakbar. I told you Christ. You can't have Christianity outside of Christ. The thing is Christianity, Christ, Christianity. Okay. So there must be, Christ is the center. Every other thing revolves around that. All the doctrinal differences, cover your hair, don't cover. Did you cook on Friday? Saturday is the worship day. No, it's Sunday. Women cannot preach. Uh, you have to eat fish that has been skilled. Don't drink this. All those tight must be paid. That must, must not be paid. <laughs> Depending on which version of Christianity, right? the Christ factor stands out like that. Okay. So here too, let's put our code of rationalism on now. If you want to be called a rationalist, says uh, Kinsey you have to at least hold on to one of the following. There are three things that are present, but not all the three must be there at once. Even if you have only one of them, that is what at least means. And I'll ask you questions like that. So if you don't understand rationalism properly, you will be beating about the bush. You might even think the person is not rationalist, but he is. Or you might think the person is rational when he's not. Just because he also believes in a reflection and intellectual work does not in itself make him rational. Because even the empirist calculates one plus one, and he will say it is equal to two. Even if he hasn't, excuse me, he hasn't seen it, he will get the issue. Even the empiricist who wants to see what he will believe will not say that I was here but I was not here at the same time in the same place. No, you say, how can you say you were not there and yet you were there? That's a contradiction. You say, oh, but you are in Paris. Did you come and see what I would have said? I don't need to see. That's the whole point. I can calculate. So analytic truths are not in contention, even for the empiric. So we'll get this. This is about four weeks ahead. I'm just saying that, so there are certain key things that the rationalism must have. Must have one of them. Is enough. If you have to, oh, even the better. If you subscribe to all three, then you are so strong and rational. So what are they? One, the thesis. The word thesis, just think of thesis as the statement, what they believe in, their, their tenet, eh? so that it doesn't become too complex for you. What, what do they subscribe to? Intuition deduction is one of them. The second one is the innate knowledge thesis they believe so this group of people those who who are rationalists because they believe that there is some knowledge that i have prior to ex prior to experience before i have senses to even experience at all in it means inborn imprinted on it inscribed the empiricists will never accept that never just like the, the Muslim will never accept, for example, okay, that uh, 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 what Jesus is God. If you are not careful, it will be haram. They will beat you up crap for you to say that in there. Yes, see that. In the same way, the empiricist like John Locke can never accept that there was anything imprinted in the mind prior to experience. He says the mind was a tabula what? Or mute and respond. Let me see if you are there. Tabula what? <laughs> Very good. Tabula rasa. Tabula rasa. Yes, sir. Empty slate. Mm -hmm. That's empiricist, like John Locke. And empiricist like Thomas Aquinas will say that there is nothing in the mind that was not written there by experience. It's experience that rooted into the mind. When you do empiricism later, you see all that. So there is no way an empiricist with his source, and a, a consistent empiricist for that matter, will subscribe to innate ideas, the, that the idea was born 
uh, was imprinted before the person even acquired sensory cap cap capacities. Eh? <laughs> I'm sure someone say, but dog, who will ever say that? Before you were a blood clot in your mother's womb, I knew you. If I say that to you, <laughs> what am I saying? Before you even became a clot to have eyes, ears, nose, what have you? I, God, I knew. You didn't have hands to see me back. If I'm God seeing you, you can't see me to gather sensations from your empirical eye or to hear or to have legs, uh, arms to touch, or tongue to taste, or nose to smell. You don't have them before you have blood clot. I knew you. So before you think there is some philosophers that are crazy, check your scripture, you and I, and all versions of religion. We are talking the, the knowledge of claims, beliefs, assumptions, that's the innate knowledge you are getting there, that you know, you know it before, innate, inborn, before you even had senses. So not just knowledge, the third one is innate concept. Some don't claim it is a knowledge. They don't talk about knowledge. Knowledge is a corpus, eh? statement of claim. That can be true or false. Concepts are terms. So the concept of beauty, the concept of justice, the concept of right, what is right, what is wrong, free will, etc. are what you call innate concept terms and eh, terminology, Plato, the world of forms versus the world of ideas. So the form of beauty is the reality. Appearances of beauty are in the beautiful phone, the beautiful lady sitting next to you, the beautiful bag you bought, but sorry, a beautiful shoe. So these are particular instances. That is what is tangible. Remember Plato, I'm just reflecting one or two with you, okay? Those are concepts. So the original, the real concept, the idea of concept is what you already have. The idea of beauty is what you already had before you started seeing particular expressions of beauty. That is innate concept. You knew beauty already. You know justice already. So if the system is not just, you don't need someone to tell you. It's not what you are learning. It's what you already know. Plato says you are forgotten. So you are only helping yourself remember. We'll get all this out there in Plato's rationalism. We want to get the key outline. Then now when we start studying specific supposed rationalist authors, we'll see the tenets in the other things, the philosophies in their a writing or the, the whatever we find in their writings that make them rational. They can pinpoint some of this. Plato thinks knowledge is just recollection. You are remembering what you already knew but have forgotten because of the stress of birth and because of this container called body that is restricting the real you. If this body releases the other one, which is the real you, you remember, you even know who killed you, if, just in case you were dead. You know who gossiped about you because there will be no distance in the spirit. Watch the Nigerian movies. You see how the Peru Ghanaian movies come out with all, when the person dies. And even we who believe people of faith, Christian religion, Hare Krishna, Ekanka, whatever you traditional, we know that when the person dies, then he, they know, ah, so it was this woman who poisoned her, did she know? Because the container called body is what restricts us, bless your vision makes your hearing you know blocked when you separate the real you from the container the body now there is no limit to what you can know there is no so on and so forth you see where we have read already inborn is the word in it so three types of tenets that if you subscribe to any one of them or more that's what at least means then we will call you rationalist every rationalist must necessity is coming must hold on to at least one of them either you believe that we come to know through the pure intuition and deduction of mind or you think we know some things already those things can be either knowledge it is wrong to kill indiscriminately is one of such i'm going there shortly okay it is wrong to just scale indiscriminately. So, but what if the, that society says that is right, the laws permit it? Plato says, for example, 
you already know it's wrong. The society may polish it for all they like. You already know. You're a human being, rational. You know it's already part of your makeup. A dog barks because it is a dog. It, it, it doesn't make sense to ask, why is the dog bark, barking? Why is it a dog? So it must bark. It is necessary to your being as a dog to bark. The problem will be when you see a human being barking. That is when it, there is news, breaking news. What is happening? Okay, so it is in your being, the world of being, it says Plato, to already know certain truth, not all, not all truth, but certain truth will get there. So innate knowledge, knowledge is a statement of truth, something that can be true or false. That's the one we call the innate knowledge thesis. It is wrong to kill and discriminate. Whatever happens must have been caused. The principle of causality. Eh? Every event must have a cause. Um, uh, give me another one. God exists. He says that is already in your being. And if you if you want to say hey, this philosophy, come to your account or our traditional setting. What do they say? Nobody teaches the child who God is. Nobody does that. That is in the Proverbs and in the maxims, the wise says of our traditional folks. Before you go all the way to Western thought, look down here. You will see that traces of it here. You don't have to teach the child that. What we call tibua. Why would tibua? There is something. The animal in your head, if you do a literal translation, utrimu abua. There is some animal in your head, con uh, conscience, eh? Telling you that this thing you are going to do. So have you seen anybody copying in an exam hall that gets up and walks around and copies? <laughs> <laughs> or he's going to steal somebody's phone and he's making everybody see. You have to do it because you already know. Says, says Plato. We'll look at quite a number of such. Okay. Then the last one is still innate concept. It is also innate, inborn, but not knowledge, not a claim of knowledge, but what? Uh, uh, an idea, a specific term, a word. Uh, uh, I've given you already free will, beauty, justice, whatever. Okay. Now, so those three, you, know, now you must have at least one to qualify to be called a rationalist in the technical sense. Okay, but then you may, a may means it's an option. We are still on Kingsley's slide. We saw the introductory one. We listened to, <coughs> we listened to Asantua, Gertrude. Uh, there was someone before that. Hold on, I remember Naomi, and we are doing. Kinsley's slide. Kinsley has warned us that before we call ourselves rationalists, we must either subscribe to one or all three. But the additional ones, the NAN to saw, call them extras. The extra you put. So you can say, I'm going to buy jollof rice and chicken, friends. But they, they might put some veggies, veggies here, some uh, uh, macaroni, with, uh, Indonesia, uh, on it some maybe big beans here, what have you. They are all fine. But if you go and the woman says, all oh, those ones are not ready. Jollof, nabeng, the jollof is cooked and chicken. But she doesn't have all the side stuff. You can't say that then what she has given you is not jollof. She has given you the jollof, Ghanaian jollof, pa, pa, pa. We're checking on it. The other ones are additions that enrich it. But without them, you can still make do with the food. It's still the jollof, essentially. Okay, and so these ones are additional. That is why you may subscribe to them or may not subscribe to them. If you don't have them, they don't make it any less rationalism. If you have them, they make it extra nice. What is that? The view that reason is indispensable. Indispensable. Some guys think that they are indispensable. Dispense means to give it. You see, dispense it. A chemist shop, you can also call it a dispensary. I don't know your. Please, can you hear me? I don't want any cut to, if it cuts off, it will disturb me. Yes. You can hear me, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, yo, yo, thank you. So, your dispensary, it means you dispense medicines there. You send medicine out from there or dispense it you give it away there okay so if someone thinks he or she is indispensable it means the person thinks he cannot be sent away 
And sometimes some sisters behave that way, some brothers behave that way in a relationship, as if they are not there. They're going to die or something. It's a joke. No human being is indispensable or indisposable. If you like, try. Even presidents. I don't want to remind us. The day you, you become whatever, that day, no, even sometime before you are out, they have started planning your day, okay? So just so that you remember the word indispensable, okay? Now, some hold the view that reason is indispensable. I say, reason must always be in the process of knowing, in the sourcing of knowledge, in the testing of knowledge, in all those things. So they think of reason as indispensable. I said, it must be there, you can't get it out. We are saying that that view must not necessarily be held by anybody before they will qualify for, uh, qualify to be called rational. It's not necessary. I must not say that there must always be reason. That means it is possible to be rationalists and still accept that sometimes reason can be dispensed with, and yet you are a consistent rationalist. Okay, so it is not a necessary view to hold on to. And then the other one that says what well, superiority of reason. Now take note, superior is not the same as precedent. If you say one is superior to the other, it's a judgment you have made. You have placed value. If you say precedent, someone, eh, look at, again, the ladies, you can have maybe four guys that are all trying to date you, eh, and you will agree to one for reasons that are best known to you, perhaps not because that one you have agreed to is better. Listen, he can maybe at this time, if you look at his life, it's, it's a mobile. Yeah, if you're looking, <laughs> but it is, it is because perhaps that person can fit your life decisions that you are making. Not that he's better than the other one. The other guy is all sorted. Listen, can take care of you. What have you, but maybe it is the child of a politician and you don't want to be meddled in, hopefully you're correct, in some political neoma for the rest of your life. Look, some pastor's wives are suffering, some pastor's husbands, some politicians' wives, they can't even talk, you can't even stand there and buy your watch. You want to buy a boy, the gun, a world gun, because of your a celebrity man or woman. You can't, you can't be you. Sometimes you just want to, you know, remove your hair and look crazy a little. They'll say, wow, you, Madame Pans, what husband, look at what you've done. You see, so for some people, the reason why they will stick to a certain option and give it precedence over the others, is not because the others are less superior, no. So giving precedence to reason as the source of knowledge or as the test of knowledge or as the warrant for knowledge claims does not necessarily suggest that you should also necessarily claim that reason is superior to other sources of knowledge. That is the whole point. So you are not obliged, friends, to subscribe to the superiority of reason thesis either. It is an addition, but it's not a necessity. And on that note, I'll pause for questions just in case there are. I know that Victoria wants to read. I know Emmanuel wants to read and Judah also. But apart from the, the two hands that are now up and, and Judas that are now up, if you have a question, please raise your hand so I can identify you amongst them. And then we, we are almost done for the day. I would take attendance. So, so please prompt your colleagues who are not here. I don't want to be hard on people necessarily. Okay. Casey, I think yours is a question. So please go ahead. If it's yes, please. Um, go ahead. Madam, please. Um, the indispensability of reason, I really didn't yes. get it well. I don't know if. Okay. Can, if someone, you, if someone, I'll do that. If someone thinks that whenever we are trying to know, remember, rationalism is a question of knowledge. So whenever we are trying to know, we must depend on reason. In other words, there cannot be knowledge without reason. Reason here means mind. We have gone through that, so I don't want to over elaborate. Not senses, but mind. Anybody that would want to say that without mind, we cannot know, is stating the indispensability of reason thesis. And we are saying that is not necessarily the case. You don't have to be 
someone who says that before you qualify to be a rationalist. Why? Because you can be rationalists and think that both reason and experience give us knowledge. Experience here means the senses. Both mind and the senses give us knowledge. You are still rationalist. A consistent rationalist for that matter. So if the persons that are giving you this note want to insist that you must also say must, must means by also, you must also say reason is indispensable. We are saying no, it is not a requirement like the earlier three. The earlier three are required. At least you must say it is by intuition deduction that we come to know. That intuition doesn't involve the senses. We'll get there shortly. If I'm, I don't know if we, I want us to go into that today, but if we get there, I'll talk about it. Okay. Intuition did actually speak the pure activity of the mind that gives you the foundation of that knowledge. It doesn't mean that senses will not play any role. Okay. Innate knowledge the same. You even need the senses to remember. Innate concept the same. But the point is, if you come and say it is reason alone, such that without reason we cannot know, you are speaking indispensability thesis. That reason cannot be dispensed with. And we are saying no, not necessarily. So it is not a necessary thesis. It is an additional one, like the macaroni and the vegetables that you put on the jollof. The main meal is, are the ones up there. These are just additional views that some rationalists may hold on to. It doesn't take away from anybody who doesn't want to subscribe to that. He will still be a consistent rationalist for the essential reasons we've stated up there. That's what I was saying. I don't know if it's clear. Case, is it better? Yes, madam. Thank you. Welcome. So we want to move on now. And I, I would take care of it. I think I called someone before. I'll take Vicky and then Emmanuel and Judah. There was a hand earlier, but I don't know if that hand has gone down. So yeah, please read this one for us. Now we are taking them one by one. Madam, please, I can't see your screen. Madam, please, I can't see your screen. I, I just moved it. Check and see if it has come. If, if no, it, who, please, who can, it has come. Oh, please, who can see it? Well, now I can, can see it. Okay. okay, Madam, please, I, I can. can see. You can see now. Okay. Yes, please. Vicky, then go ahead. Go ahead. No. The, the intuition or, come, okay. or deduction yeah. teases. The intuition yeah. or deduction teases. Mm. This thesis concerns how we become warranted in believing some propositions in a particular subject knowable by us by intuition alone. Mm -hmm. Still, others are knowable by being deduced from int intuited propositions. Note, the nature of intuited truth needs explanations. Explanation, it does. Well done. Thank you, Shut up. No, please, it's fine. Well done. So Vicky is now taking those theses, the singular thesis. See that this is S-I-S, it means one. The three of them together is what we used, T-H-E-S-E-S. -E -E so this is one of them, the intuition deduction thesis. What is that? What view of rationalism is that? Rationalism, generally, we have, we have seen that. Reason is the source of all knowledge. Reason is the test, blah, blah, blah. But which version of rationalism are we labeling as the intuition deduction thesis of rationalism? It is that one which says that we come to accept certain claims. I am a, an intuition deduction thesis kind of rationalist. I subscribe to that kind of rationalism. When I make the claim that knowledge comes to us by or from intuited truth, I intuited first, and then based on what I have intuited, I make deductions. And the, the simple definition of intuition you can write down if you're making your note is what? Truth that is just there. <laughs> and people, <laughs> truth that is just there, unmediated truth. There is no mediation. It didn't pass through anything to come, not through the senses, not through another statement. No, no, it is just there. Truth that is just there, or you can say unmediated truth. That is intuited truth. You are you are shocked when 
the car said, I think, therefore I am. What was he appealing to? Nothing. If I think, then there must be that which does the thinking. Whatever it is, we don't know. But there can't be thinking going on without a thing that does the thinking. That is the, the intuition, intuitive truth. From that, he deduced the external world. And then for the existence of the external world, he needs an ultimate being to sustain that. That secularity argument you'll see later on when we do his meditations, five, six. Okay. So I'm saying that when we start looking at specific authors, you see truth that is just the intuition by just the, the language of it sometimes, or by just, <clears throat> by just looking at the, the statement itself. It is true, unmediatedly. Truth that is just the necessary self-evident truth. You can write that also. Necessary and self-evident truth that don't need justification because it is just there. It is unmediated. Cogito ego sum is one of them, at least from Cartesian perspective. Okay. And so from that one, he deduced the existence of matter. And from that, the existence, no, no, the existence of God and then to the existence of matter. Now, so that version of rationalism, it hasn't said that anything was written in your mind before you were born and all that. That sounds religious. That sounds platonic, Plato's version, okay, Christian or religious. Let me just say religious. It sounds religious. I can be a rationalist and I haven't made any claim and I wouldn't have made any claim at all about innateness or inborn ideas or anything. You have to understand that. This version of rationalism is where the intellect is playing a role, deduction, like deductive logic, what you are doing. Mechanistic, you know, if this one happened, then this was follow. And if this follows, then that's what therefore this is it. That is purely truth or knowledge. That has nothing to do with the sense. We haven't even actually seen if there is chichi. If there is chichi, there it will be chacha. And if there is chacha, there it will be chocho. That will show me if there is chichi, there it will be chocho. Hypothetical syllogism. I want to say it again. If there is chichi, then there will be chacha. And if there is chacha, then there will be chocho. That means if there is chichi, then there will be chocho. That is purely self-evident truth based on what? Deduction. I deduced the claim that if there is chichi, then there will be chocho. From where? From the given premises. But the premises are not speaking to actuality. Is there actually chichi and chocho? No. Experience is what would have established that we either see, hear, touch, or taste. Okay, if we went to heaven, then we will not cry again. At least that's a Christian version. No more crying there. We are going to see that. So if we went to heaven, then we will not cry. And if we will not cry, then we will not need to drink water. <laughs> because we don't, need, we don't have any water spilling out of our body. Therefore, if we go to heaven, then we will not have to drink water. The same hypothetical synergies. Have we gone to heaven? Does it say whether we have actually gone to heaven or not? No. Does it tell us whether there is actually crying there or not? No. Does it doesn't speak to content. Hello? It is just concerned about intellectual patterns, deduction based on given premises. So I can be this and so anti-religious, so anti anything that you think, and still be rationalist. You can't always give rationalism a certain tone that it is a, a, a religious man's whatever. Okay. I just wanted you to see that. And therefore, if you hear, if you study, then you will pass. Kofi, well, let me see the name I see on my screen and let me use that. If you study, uh -huh, then you have passed. Ernestina has studied, therefore, all of us. I want a, a chorus answer. If you study, then you will pass. Ernestina has studied, therefore. Ernestina has passed. She will pass. She will pass. She will pass. Very good. She will Ernestina pass. will pass. Madam, Ernestina has passed. Pass. I've not written Ernestina on the board. Therefore, Ernestina will pass. Therefore, Ernestina will pass. Therefore, Ernestina is passing. Therefore, Ernestina shall pass. Therefore, Ernestina has passed. All so I'm coming. All these are correct, but none of them speaks to the actuality, the actual thing. You see, if Ghana gets six billion from IMF, 
then Ghana will be like heaven. Ghana has gotten six billion from IMF. Therefore, Ghana will be like heaven. That's Modus Ponens. Who doesn't know that? You know that big time. Does that speak to the actuality? Well, that actually, <laughs> six billion has come and Ghana has become heaven. No, it's just <laughs> the yeah. I'm just saying that so it is not actually if it rains, the ground will be get uh, will be wet. It has rained. So you see, therefore the ground will be that's modus ponens. It's valid, it's deductive. The conclusion depends hundred percent on the premises. So that conclusion you have arrived at is a pure matter of what? The form. It has nothing to do with experience. It is purely mind, intellectual deduction, no problem about that. So we, we will say it is what? Intuition, deduction, just in case you intuited the starting point and you deduce, you are using a method that will be called rationalist in its approach, in its method. Does that speak to the source, the content, the actuality? No, sir. It hasn't told you because it can rain and the ground will not be wet. You have your part because you are inside there. The ground is covered with canopies. It won't be wet back or now she do all the part, everything. That is why we are saying that. Back to my screen. The person couldn't see can you see now that there is a way of no, being rationalist. Oh, right. They, they are no. Buy correct phone, buy correct phone. Buy correct phone. I've stopped again. Eh? Buy correct phones. Eh? <laughs> so you can see where we are. <laughs> That's what somebody told someone sometimes. I say, hey, what fast? I'm not here. If you phone, yeah, I'll see. You see, you can see. Okay, I think it will come shortly. I'm resharing. Okay. You should you should see it now. I, I, I appreciate it to give yourself some few minutes, some are network too as well. Okay, so at least you have a fair idea of what the intuition did. Yeah, the intuition deduction thesis. It says you intuit on mediated truth, something you know self-evidently. Then based on that, you derive at this. That is why we describe Descartes' method as foundationalist levels hundred and two hundred. Remember, if you've forgotten, go back to the academic channel, please. We have recordings there from your class and the previous ones and the previous one all clearly labeled. Go and look at Descartes' way of arriving, how we're arriving at uh, setting to the cogito and why we call his method foundationalist, uh, the Archimedes principle. You, you, you fix your compass at one place, then you turn it around, around, around. So for us, you know that it is fixed at one place. Wherever you turn it around, we'll have the same distance or the radius will be the same all around. So if you have a fixed point of certainty, you can revolve around in your epistemological field. You won't be afraid to wave, wave, uh, wander off, off too much. So intuition deduction is just talking method. Get the one that you know self-evidently, intuition, intuitive truth, one that you know for certain. That doesn't need, supposedly, doesn't need any justification. Then use that one as your basis and build it. That sounds like the logic that God used to bring Christ to save the world. If you believe that, huh? yeah, get one that is correct, perfect, a foundation that is laid. Then every other one will have a dependent perfection. They stand on that perfection to, to rise up. If the foundation is weak, who, who, who can? Okay, so there is no other foundation laid than the one that was laid. These are all supposed to be our scripture. Showing you the logic behind Killing one seed, if you're a farmer, you will put one seed down there and out of it will come several. They all emerge from the several. It's the same logic. Intuitive truth then becomes the mother, the one that holds everything together, the foundation on which the deduced truth stands. So it's a methodological approach to being rationalist, which has not made any claim about actuality. I deduced something doesn't mean it is there. Take note, if P then Q, P therefore Q. Does it even mean that there is a P sitting anyway? It's not existential. When we do the second part of deductive logic, I think Rich, Dr. Chris will take you through those, okay. 
there is the claim of hypothetical, it's a hypothetical statement, universal quantifier, which doesn't necessarily claim that there exists anything like that. Then you can make the existential claims as well. Okay, you, this is methodological. Well done. Thank you, my lady, uh, Vicky. Let me take someone else. I think we can finish for the rest of have all been overly well elaborated. I, I'm tempted to share that as well. I'll take Emmanuel Freeman and I'll come to Judah. Emmanuel, go ahead. Emmanuel, please read for me. Freeman. If, if Freeman is not able to, Judah, I can read. Maybe he's still organizing folks to come. He is an organizer. <laughs> Judah, you're mute and read for me, please. Okay, madam. Yes, sir. Intuition or deduction, continuation. So, whereas we just see intuited propositions to be true, deduction, deduction is a process of deriving valid conclusions from intuited premises. Recall validity. If premises are true, then conclusion must necessarily be true also. Otherwise, contradiction. Thank you. Very good. Perfect. You are welcome. That is what I have overly elaborated on already with all the several examples I gave. So that is the relationship. This one is methodological. Nationalists but emphasizing the method of arriving at that mind truth, okay? truth that is coming from the mind. That's why he's rationalist. It doesn't depend on senses. But that truth is warranted by how mind is working. From what is intuited, it deduced. That one, I told you, doesn't speak to content. It doesn't tell you whether it is actually raining or it, the ground is actually wet or something. No, it just said, if if it had rained, then the ground would have been wet. It has rained. It has, this it has rained doesn't mean it has actually rained. He said, if P were true, then Q will follow. Now, if we take it to mean that P has happened, then we would have to also take it to mean that Q will follow. None of them makes any claim of truth, whether it has actually, because that is the concern. The concern is truth that we claim to know. Okay, and so someone will tell you, no, 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 you already know it. Another person, no, 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 I want to see before I can accept. That's the rationalist empiricist contention, not linguistic babbling. Okay, very good. Jida, maybe you read this also so that you can, you can pause. Okay, madam. Mm. Thus, intuition and deduction prov provide us with, an, with knowledge uh, a priori. Very good. It's Which correct. is to say knowledge gained independently of experience. This is what I've been saying all this while with my long talk. That is it. Intuition deduction then gives us a prior knowledge. Knowledge that is gained prior to experience, independently of experience, apart from experience. Experience means the senses. Okay. So knowledge gained a priori, that is prior to experience. I get that knowledge. I know it before I experienced. It is not the experience that is telling me. That's why it's rationalist. How did I get it? I say, I say if this one happened, that Nanka, this one will follow. So if we assume that this has happened, then this one must follow. This 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 one must follow the modus ponens conclusion. Is arrived at prior to experiencing. If he was not there, then he couldn't have stolen the money. You say he was not there. So I conclude that he couldn't have stolen the money. You see that? Maybe he was there, he's lying. Maybe he has never really been, maybe there was no money that is missing. These are the actualities. But we are saying granted that he were there, he would have stolen. It's a granting, it's an assumption. Asiomatization, that's what we do when we do deduction. Senka. It is not speaking to whether it actually happened or not. Okay. So to deduce 
means you have a self-evident supposed assumed given keep your mind on deductive logic you see what i'm saying given that p conditional q then this use conditional proof to prove the other one all the steps you will go through will be proofs they will move from warranted justifiable claims even where you assume you assume for a reason because of the logic behind it none of them is saying whether actually p happened or q for it or x no it's not actuality it's a, a form a structure of thought, a part okay so we know it a prior on your screen everyone please watch because special students may read let me take an estina let's now read the last slide we have just about two more to go and then i'll sum up for you go Tina, go ahead. Okay, maybe Tina is struggling. So truths that are knowable by intuition deduction. Some of them are on your screen now, please look. But some are mathematical in nature. The ones we call analytic truths. Hmm? Two plus five equals seven. Wherever I see two plus, I'll put seven there. I know that by intuition, the meaning of two, the meaning of five, will give you seven. I don't need to observe two oranges and five uh, or mangoes before I can count. It only helps me know what is already there, but not already put in to my head. <laughs> I said intuitive truth is truth that is just there. The meaning of two, the meaning of plus, the meaning of five. Now, some, someone will say, but doc, the meaning of two need three and five. Now. Who, who says two should be? Should be, should mean that way. <laughs> Who said we should two should mean that? That is the point. Okay, because since 19 could the whole that we said two is two. It has always been two. Do you know why? Because they are self-evident. It's just there. Mathematics is like that. Logic is like that. But the the height of that building or the tree or what have you keeps changing. Yesterday I nearly beat my little boy up because. He's telling me that oxygen, let me ask the class if you know. <laughs> Do plants breathe in oxygen or carbon dioxide? I want an answer. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I want a chorus answer. Nobody should hide. Carbon dioxide. Plants. Carbon dioxide. They, they, they breathe in yes. carbon dioxide, right? Yes. And then they breathe yes. and then they breathe out oxygen. That's what I, I also learned it too. As <laughs> one they have lied to us. They said it is only when the plant is preparing its photosynthesis that it breathes yes. in, it takes or its respiration, whatever. It takes in, excuse me, it takes in carbon dioxide. But apart from that, plants are like animals. They take in oxygen and bring out carbon dioxide. Yesterday, I said yes, yesterday. This one is no news in my own home here. I nearly beat my class, uh, class five, my class five, class five years old. I said, mommy, don't change it. Don't change it. You see, they, when they bring the home, <laughs> you have to say, I said, ah, now you want to do that animals, uh, you have the plants breathing uh, carbon dioxide. They give us the carbon dioxide and we give them the oxygen. It's, they give us the oxygen, then we give them the carbon dioxide. That's what I was telling you. So we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. And they take, I'm trying to make a point, but that's the reason why I'm talking to them. Not knowing the only the one that we know, which is that what the plant breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out oxygen so that we will take in the oxygen and breathe out carbon but they said no plant you go if it is google and see plants like animals breathe in oxygen and then they breathe out carbon dioxide it is only when they have to do their photosynthesis preparation of their food that they take carbon dioxide so <laughs> And it is in the textbook, and it's in the lab, whatever. And I searched online. So what did what did I use that example to show? What we thought we knew, they keep changing. The empirical ones, because observation is still ongoing. That's whole the whole thing. We don't know if some time to come, 
five months old, people can deliver. And when they deliver, the, the, the children will be working. Some can even fly. Remember, we may even grow feathers as we advance and start flying. Or we may, we may be standing at the department after lecture. It's okay, see you later, see you later. Everybody hates their time. Bah, bah, and we disappear, we have reached our room. We don't know. Why? It's observation based. Will mathematical figures change? No. Because they are deductive. They are meaning inclined. That is how we think of the words juice. Now, so there are, I'm, I'm speaking those who believe in intuition and deduction. So analytics, you can't say I was here, but I was not here. You can never tell me that the angels in heaven are totally naked and yet they are totally covered in their gowns. Uwa, this statement I just made is already false. You say, hey, have you been to heaven before? I said, it can't happen. If they are totally naked, they cannot be at the same time totally covered. You see that it's in the language analysis. Totally naked and totally covered. And obwa. If you say totally naked or totally covered, that is tautology, you remember. But this one said end. That is already false. So each truth is self-evident. It's just there. Based on that, you can deduce others. So we have mathematical truths. The second one, we have ethical truths. Those that have to do with morality, good, bad, right, wrong. One example is, I said, look at the title. Truth that we supposedly know by intuition deduction. It is wrong to kill humans indiscriminately. We put humans there because some don't care about the animals or we kill the animal like something and enjoy. But at least for humans, people are a bit sensitive. When you are killing them indiscriminately, and not discriminating. Maybe you are killing in self-defense. We don't say it's right, but at least it may be justifiable. Or you are killing in the context of war. So some such things. But where there's no discrimination, you they all die, be die. They are killing dead. These folks tell you that you self-evidently know that already by intuition. And therefore, they are not something we need justification for. You will see that such truths, when you go to the innate knowledge and innate concept folks, they will say, we already know. These people are not saying you already know it like it was inscribed there. No. They say, you know it self-evidently. They don't need justification. That's the whole point. Unmediated, it's obvious that you cannot kill indiscriminately. That's the whole point. And then the third one is metaphysical claims. I'm sorry, I think the folks have come. Metaphysical claims, like God exists, we have free will, our mind and body are distinct substances, every event must have a cause. These are all supposedly intuited truths that leads to deduction, according to folks. Look at this, how radical. If you have a lot of claims that you consider to be known, by intuition. So many claims, not a few. Okay, but you say almost every claim we have, we make, we know it by intuition. It makes your rationalism a radical one. I said, is this one there is too strange? You did everything was intuited. It will make your view too radical, too extreme, sort of. Okay. And then also, if you have certain controversial claims, of course, if I say it is wrong to kill indiscriminately, you might not consider it controversial. But for some, claims like God exists, they think it's controversial. How do you justify the existence of God? It's just some assumption people make, they think. Okay. Or if you say we all know already, certain claims, they, they feel it's controversial and therefore such views will make your, your, your rationalism more radical than others. Okay. Now, if you, you make extreme, I've said all this already, so I would have just gone through, but city can put it. Yeah, my baby lad, so I take my time. Look, beyond even the slightest, hey, if the main campus before here, me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you are you too, you are my firstborn, so I give you the best. Eh? These are baby lads, so I give them so much attention. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know you are there. So I'll post this on the main campus platform as well. Now listen, some warranted beliefs that go beyond even the slightest doubt. When you make that self-evident claim seem to be beyond the slightest doubt. As a way dear, it to mean doubted that what I have arrived at by my mind. 
through such intuition and deduction. There is no way, listen, look at the language, no way we can even raise any doubt about it. That generates a certain sense of radicalism. How radical can that be? Who said that what you believe we know self-evidently cannot be doubted? You think it's, there is no way to doubt it? It increases the degree of radicalism, extremism that you have beyond reasonable doubt when you say all those such things. Eh? When you say whatever on my screen now, please, when you say whatever you intuit must be true, I force. What if your intuition was faulted? You know, so the sense in which we say it is infallible, into me, in your NFA mistake, it cannot be wrong. What has been self evidently arrived at is what makes the view more radical. Look at that. So, how many views you call as intuited truths, how controversial they are, the label you put to it that they are beyond the, the, the most reasonable doubt. They are not fallible at all. Such claims, when you make them around the plenty controversial views you put into uh, intuition and deduction, then it makes the view extremely radical. It makes it extremely radical. It makes us think that it makes it extremely radical. And we're saying that, oh, that cannot be sustained. It cannot be a view to support. So if there are few like goddesses, like it is wrong to kill indiscriminately. Like every event must have a cause. These are the ones you see are intuited truth. Not that what I will wear tomorrow, the dress I will, my hair do, and the color I will use to paint my hair next week. You know, I intuited it. It makes it look like, hey, they're booming. You know, and then now people cannot, cannot uh, uh, agree to or embrace such a view. It will be extremists. It will be fundamentalists. It will be unnecessarily stanch and we will negate it with our questions. Get ready to write. I've seen a hand up. Okay, so here we will do the next one will be on the innate concept thesis, which is a, a younger brother to the innate knowledge thesis. Okay, because the concepts really that come together to form a knowledge. But we will, we will work on that one for the next week. I just put a summary there for those who may be interested. Mm. The intuition deductive in the deduction thesis, the innate knowledge thesis and the innate concept thesis are essential to rationalism. I've said that to be a rationalist is to adopt at least one of them. Any questions, please, before I focus on something else that I want to do. Question. Yes, please. My dear, go ahead. You said question, please. So can you mute and ask? And let's wrap up quickly with a reminder on the group work that you're supposed to do. I see three hands up. Are they all questions? And it's Tina Kusika, is just a question. Tina, okay, Tina's hand is down. Janet, as Antoa, you wanted to read for me, or it's a question. It's a question, please go ahead. If not, Gabriel's hand is also up. Abby, go ahead. Uh, okay, but I'm it's about to subject my understanding to see if I'm right. Very good. Um, the moderate um, rationalist that that uh, claim that reason precedes uh, the other knowledge. Yes. So yes. reason precedes so, the senses in knowing. Uh -huh. Knowing. Uh -huh. Um, when you, when you're talking about the intuition in induction thesis. Yes. Where we give an example, I think we can also use our empirical sense to know that two plus five equals seven. So do you have to see? Point, no, it's not true. I'm coming. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I'm coming. That one is not correct. I don't need to see two plus three to know that it's equal to five. You as a special student with, with visual impairment, whether he has to see to know two plus three. <laughs> that is the whole thing. We understand two plus three. We don't see it to know it. We only see it to help us remember what we know. Because if I cannot see, if I've never seen two and I've never seen three, not the figure two, but like you put two CDs in my 
That's that joke I often give in class. If I were taking arms, I can see. So you are accompanying me to beg for arms, which our folks don't do really. Okay, then and then Gabriel passes by and puts two CD in my calabash. And you yourself, you tell me, oh, as soon as he came to pass, he gave you two CD. I also oh, thank you very much. God will bless him. The other person also comes to pass by. He also gave me three cities. You told me the first, because I can't see the figure. But you told me the, the first person gave you two cities. The second person has also given you three cities. I said, oh, God will bless them. Now when we're closing and we'll have to go home, ask you, how much do I have? So you see that the first person gave you two cities and the second one gave you three cities. So the total is one city, okay? <laughs> then I tell you, oh, I said two back on a three back on there. It shouldn't be one city. You see, you can't see that. I can see. I'm telling you, it's one city. What do you want me to want to say about it? I don't need to see. You see that? Two and three are definitions. Remember real definitions in the critical thinking. You forgot it. They are many inclined. What we mean by two, and what we mean by three, and what we mean by art. It's what gives us the answer five. I don't have to see it. It's just like saying that in heaven, all the angels are wearing gowns, and yet they are all totally naked. That is false. If you tell me, oh, but you haven't been to heaven. If you saw what I saw, I did uh, whatever you saw, this one cannot be possible. If they were wearing gowns, they can't be at the same time to, to, totally, totally is the word, totally naked. No, it's not correct. It, it is in the language. Don't tell me I didn't see it. So it is not um, empirical. We don't need to see, hear, touch, taste, or smell anything. If Gabriel said, I have never been to city campus. I don't even know where the place is. I've never been there. And yet that day, you see, when I went there, no dog, I didn't touch anything in the classroom. <laughs> if you speak that way, it's already false. It's called contradiction. And it is not because, oh, but you haven't seen me. If you know what, how I brought, I was brought up and I'm found. If you said I have never been there, and yet you say when I was there, no, so I didn't touch it. Are you there? Were you there or not there? That is, that is the, it's the language. Okay. And so such claims, oh dear. Such claims, sorry, I have to meet everyone again. Such claims are self-evidently by deduction and intuition. It's, when I say to deduce and to intuit, it's self-evidently false. That is the whole point of those, those folks. There's language in it. And I'm saying that the controversy, you were asking something about precedence. If I finish intuiting and deducing, and I say that, so what I'm saying is more likely to be true. That is a soft position. It's moderate. But I can finish intuiting and deducing and want to insist that what I'm saying is certainly true by force. That will make my position radical. So precedence means when you finish, you are saying that, well, so I intuited it. I have arrived at this conclusion, or I, I presumed in it ideas and worked with it. But I still leave room for the possibility that senses will augment what I thought I had. It is still innate knowledge or intuition deduction, but you are making room for the possibility of the empirical. It makes the position softer. The number of views you are including are less. It makes your position more moderate than the one who, after that same process, concludes, look at the conclusion, that therefore it is certainly God I saw in my dream. God came to me. Maybe you were you had over eaten. Maybe it was a demon that came to you. Maybe it was an angel. And so on. So if you finish and you say, therefore, what I have arrived at is certainly certainty, then we, we might be thinking that the degree of certainty are associating with that claim makes it what? Radical. That is what we are saying with the empirical term, eh, with the degree of radicalism. I don't know if those comments help Gabriel a little bit. Okay, okay, it's fine. All right, thank you. We'll build on it again when we advance. Thank you. So for, for uh, just to sum up, for City Campus, Prima, if you are there, what is our arrangement for the, what question did I give you for the, I don't have my files immediately by me, here, but what was your question for your group work and what was our arrangement? Anybody wants to put a reminder, some are now joining. 
the class very quickly so that we can end, please. Doc. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Doc, please, um, you created a group, but I don't think um, questions were given to the respective oh, groups. No, 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 respective group. I gave a, the class a question to go and study. The rational. Yes, yes please. Yes, the rational is easy. Read it and then. The rational is easy. Just read it to the class. What has it done, sir? Uh -huh, Omar. I want those who were not in. So we come to class and present that game. Informal, like lecture um, in the class Madam, and all that. And he said, um, you can point anybody at the I said, write. So, very good. So, write a presentation on the rationalist thesis. Now, we have discussed the rationalist thesis. So, we have to put flesh to it. Otherwise, you'll come and repeat all I've told you. So, would you be. This is the question now that you will take the week to do for our next week's session in person. Okay. Would you be an intuition deduction thesis rationalist? Everyone, please write it down somewhere. Or you would be an innate knowledge thesis rationalist. Why or why not? Then you will use practical examples to make your point. Would you, I'm repeating the question, would you be an intuition deduction thesis rationalist or innate knowledge? thesis rationalist why or why not it's a presentation by a group i want a group to work not individuals i will choose the group that will present the and who and who in the group will present when the group comes to standard i'll say you my lady you my gentleman please tell us what the group has you have to work together i want people to engage content would you be an intuition deduction thesis rationalist, or you would be an innate knowledge thesis rationalist. Why or why not? Use illustrations to make your point. Any question? Madam, please, I wanted to ask what of videos. That if you don't raise your hand, does it help me? I don't know who I'm talking to. It's who? Please tell me who, who is speaking. Is this Uwera? Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh -huh. But I was asking of we, that we don't have a group yet. We just joined the class. I'm still speaking. If you don't have a group, why <laughs> you tell me? Then I'm getting angry. <laughs> why did you take up till the lecture, my lady? Eh? When my sister came, I, with my baby cry, we were all happy in class. We didn't want back class. Is it? <laughs> don't mind me. Okay. Oh, and it's not an excuse. You don't need registration before you enter the lecture. I came physical. It was intentional. You see that? I came to the lecture physically. Why would it? Will we check registration at the entrance before you come and sit down? Right, so don't give excuses. Okay, let's talk. I'm saying that those who do not have a group, there's a reason why. I want you to do the group work thing in class. Maybe we should just end this recording, which will go to all the people. These are in-house in matters. So thank you very much for audience. I wish you well, all the best. Yes, I was saying that 